today about um, plugging the copyright gap and I'm joined here by uh, Tom Woodhouse who's a partner in my firm Page White and Farrow. We're a firm operating out of London, Leeds and Munich and we specialise in IP protection and in particular we're focusing today on how to best protect your AI innovation. So I wanted to start here. Uh, there's a general feeling uh, with people who work in this sector, any software sector actually, and AI in particular, that they've somehow got inherent protection for their work by almost by its nature. Uh, and if you look at this pie chart in front of you, you can see that there are three different sectors that I've highlighted. Now, each of these sectors contains different kinds of intellectual property rights. The dark blue are so-called confidential rights. The pink are so-called copying rights. And the light blue are so-called registered rights. Now, most of you will have understood one of the dark blue rights, at least, of confidential information, and one of the pink rights, at least, of copyright. But I'm here today to explain how these rights work and what the limitations are in the dark blue and pink sectors. So copyright, which is one of the copying rights in the pink sector, requires actual copying. So this right only persists in a situation where other people are reproducing your own code. It doesn't protect the idea itself that could take your idea and recode it. I'm getting a bit of background noise, actually. I don't know whether it's possible to stop that. Anyway, so, yeah, so, so we call this plugging the copyright gap because the right of copyright only extends against other people who actually have access to what you have developed and who directly reproduce it. There's no protection for the idea in itself. So, despite the background noise, I'm going to carry on and talk about confidential information. So, confidential information is a type of right which protects you to a certain extent where you have managed to keep some information actually confidential. So, it requires a duty of confidence. It isn't an inherent right that just exists because you have developed something in your own back end or in a locked down software manner. You have to take steps to make sure that your confidential information is retained confidential. This, this right isn't a right as such. It doesn't protect other people from copying your confidential information. It only protects against somebody who actually takes the confidential, confidential information away from you. Also, the right is lost completely when the knowledge enters the public domain. So it doesn't protect you against independent derivation, somebody else who independently comes up with the same information or the same code or the same model, whatever it is that you're doing. And furthermore, it doesn't stop someone else from patenting the same idea later, even if you got there first. So although many producers of products based on AI feel that they are protected because others can't see the AI and therefore it's hidden and confidential or trade secret. In fact, this right is very limited and Tom will go into a case study later which shows you how the right simply diminishes over time. So here's, here's the way to plug those gaps. Patents. So what are patents? Patents are a registered right. You have to take active steps to maintain them. But they're a monopoly right. They're a true monopoly right. In order for somebody to infringe your patent, they don't need to have seen what you've done, whether behind the scenes, confidential information, or in front of the scenes, what your model's actually doing. It doesn't require copying to infringe the right. Anybody who implements the same idea or the same concept that you have protected by way of a patent will be infringing your patent. So it's a very powerful right. It's a very broad right. You don't have to restrict your patent to particular implementations 
or particular bits of code or particular mathematical models. You can extract the broad concept which is being implemented in that code or those models and protect that with a patent. Now, patents can last for up to 20 years, so they also have a long lifetime. However, most patents don't last that long. It's in the hands of the patent owner as to whether or not they renew their patent each year once it's been granted to them. So you can decide how long your patent lasts. And another important point that I want to make about patents, particularly given a software audience, is although it's a monopoly right, you don't have to assert it. You're not required to take your patent and stop other people doing what you have patented. You can control who does it. You can control the players in the marketplace. You can decide philanthropically to give away your idea, but you can give it away to people who you actually want to have it and who you think are going to be using it for good. So to that extent, patents are not only a very powerful tool, they're a very flexible tool in the context of your business. So can you protect software and AI innovation? This is a really interesting question because the, over, the overwhelming feeling for many AI producers is that AI is somehow maths or somehow academic or somehow just software, maths embodied in software. And there's a feeling that many of those things can't actually be protected by way of patents. And a lot of people in the field of AI actually ignore the potential to protect their innovation properly with a patent, which will secure their protection. You can patent any solution to a technical problem, which is new and non-obvious. So the criteria that you're looking at is, is your AI doing something which has a technical effect? a concrete physical effect? Is it improving something, working in the real world in some way? That problem can be solved in software and generally with AI, it's solved in a combination of machine learning models, training methods, data collection, all kinds of ways in which you can innovate within your AI, solving various different problems. I'm not really going to talk much about what non-obvious means. That's a little bit esoteric for this talk, but there is an important criteria that you do need to understand and which will come up in the case study that Tom's going to talk about in a moment. In order for you to patent something, it has to be new. That is, it has to be something which is not already in the public domain. If something is in the public domain, you can't protect it by way of a patent. And here's the rub you can destroy the novelty of your own invention. So if you put your own software or AI model or product into the public domain before you've taken advice about patenting, you have already destroyed the novelty of your own invention and you won't be able to patent it after that. So one key takeaway is to take advice early in the game when you're looking at your AI innovation. So I think I'm handing at this point over to Tom to take us through a case study on this. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Virginia. So this, this is a hypothetical company that I'm gonna talk about now, but it's it's based on real life. And, and all of the things that I'm gonna talk about have happened in real life to companies we've worked with over the years. So for the sake of this case study, I'm gonna assume that we have some startup company has particular expertise in some particular area of data science, say. Uh, and what's quite common for these kind of software startup companies with very specialist expertise is that actually they're providing support and services to larger companies. So they're essentially allowing larger companies to sort of outsource a particular component of their kind of data problem because the startup has really cracked a way to actually actually solve this problem around the data in a, in a particular context. Now, what we see here is essentially a kind of machine learning type pipeline. And a lot of this won't be new. A lot of it will be kind of off the shelf stuff. But, but within that are a couple of really key things that are new and give the company its, its leading edge. And in this case, uh, I've said that could be in the user interface so that the way that the 
product is presented to customers and the effective way it allows them to get insights into the data, there's some real novelty and innovation in that UI layer. The other piece is some of the back-end analytics, whether that's in the particular way of training or triaging the data, some of the know-how in the, in the expertise of the, the people within the company. In this case, the startup hasn't really taken much in the way of steps to actually identify or codify that, work out really what it is and, and where it falls in, in the spectrum of all those, those different rights that Virginia was talking about. What they have is just a sort of loose notion of trade secrets. Trade secrets protect the core AI and the analytics and all of the, we're not gonna think too much about trying to pin down what the clever innovative stuff we're doing is. We know it's something and it's in the back end and it's all trade secrets. And that's quite a common attitude that you get from, from companies in the early days. Uh, and I'm gonna look now at the kind of dangers that can happen if you are overly reliant on rights that are firstly limited and secondly rights that are not fully understood and particularly where the limits of them aren't fully understood. So what happens next? Well for the first couple of years everything's great. It's a truly innovative company. They've they've cracked a problem, a specific problem, but but a really key problem for, for a number of customers, a number of these bigger businesses. Uh, and they have the first mover advantage. And that really does give them the edge for the year or two. They are doing very well at getting contracts, new customers, bringing in business. You know, this, this business is, is slowly but surely growing. The problem is, is that first mover advantage does diminish over time. And the particular event that happens here is that one of their biggest customers, their CTO, takes a look at what they're doing, takes a look at the money they're spending on, on what he sees as kind of outsourcing services, when from his perspective, they have a very good in-house team and decides, well, why are we doing this? We can take this in-house. Now, at that point, the startup might turn around and think, well, they, they can't do that because my, my tech is proprietary. But is it? So, so if we go back to the very earliest days of the company here, yes, it is proprietary. You, you've got a limited number of people starting out. Those ideas are genuinely confidential just for the simple reason that they've only been shared between sort of one or two people within the company. There hasn't been any of those opportunities for that to leak out into the public domain. So for that short window of time, yes, you do indeed have a large amount of confidential information, including the kind of broad insights, the, the key things that can drive that business forward, maybe. The pro problem is, is that that starts to diminish very quickly. So the broadest ideas around the innovation in this company, as soon as you start having those early discussions with potential investors, whether that's informal chats, whatever, early stage pitching, even if you are taking some kind of steps to withhold some of the key information about the algorithms or the, the kind of details in the back end, you've already started to give away those broadest ideas because they're now in the public domain. And you've put them in the public domain through these various potentially informal verbal channels just by talking about them to people outside your own company. And this gets worse and worse over time. So as a company grows, it's, it's not enough just to say we've got this magic box in the, black end, uh, in the back end that can do all of these, these wonderful things. You, you need to sell your tech. And in order to sell your tech, you need to, to tell people about it. So exhibiting at tech events, actually releasing your product. So the second that, that UI that I talked about a few slides back, once that UI has gone into the public domain and has been available for customers to use, all that wonderful new innovative AI, uh, UI functionality has now gone into the public domain. So it's certainly not confidential information anymore. Pitching, opening up APIs to customers again and all the documentation that goes with that. And what you see is, is a lot of this kind of stuff that is now out there in the public domain. It's no longer protected by confidential information. The code itself might be protected by copyright, but the ideas aren't. Now, even with this, the company might still have some sort of loose idea of their core IP, their trade secrets at the core of this, that, that even with all the stuff that's out there, we know that this is locked down. This is only within the company. Except it might not be as locked down as you actually think. 
And in the particular situation we're talking about here, what you have over time, this, this small startup innovative company working with customers and their in-house teams, that startup has been drip feeding information to their customers over a number of years. Not only has the startup been educating those customers in their solution to this problem, as part of that, at least some of these core ideas and IP have been slowly leaking out over time. You might not really be able to pin down any one event when this happened, but over a number of years with engineers talking to each other and providing the service they need to provide in order to serve their customers, this stuff is starting to leak out. And once that's in the public domain, uh, it's in the public domain for good. There's no rowing back. So to the startup in this situation, the customer's about to take it all in-house, is it proprietary? Well, not really. Not to the extent that all of this stuff has now gone out into the public domain. And they're now in a position where their customer have learned enough from the startup to at least build their own serviceable solution. It probably isn't as good as the startup's one. It's probably an inferior solution. But when it comes down to that question that the CTO is making over cost and favoring the work of his own team, that's not necessarily going to be the thing that, thing that saves it. So, and at the same time, the customers had access to the user interface. They're not copying the visual appearance. So there's no infringement in the, the look and feel in, in the registered or, or any, uh, sorry, in the unregistered design rights that you have in this, in this user interface. So again, they're free to take that functionality and recode it themselves. Now, worth still, when you actually drill down into it further, it turns out there's all sorts of other channels where this core IP trade secrets has been leaking, leaking through the company like a sieve. And that could be a PhD student who interned for six months who it turned out included key details of the back end in their PhD thesis. That's not a hypothetical situation that has happened in real life. The other is that actually it's been independently derived. Someone else, some competitor who, you know, started out a couple of years behind them has now caught up and they've independently derived this. They haven't taken the company's confidential information and put it in the public domain. They've, they've derived that same information and put it in the public domain. But that's, that's neither here nor there. It's still no longer confidential information. So the company has lost any protection it had over that. Worse, the mechanism by which that competitor might have put it in the public domain is when they patented it themselves. And they're free to do that because up until that point, it was, it was confidential and it wasn't in the public domain. Uh, and the other killer is that the marketing team have been getting hold of this stuff and have been, been pitching it left, right and center. Again, not, a, not hypothetical. And to the extent that these discussions were, ha that the startup was having with its customers, it thought it was okay because it had signed NDAs with these customers. But actually that's been 50 different customers with 50 different NDAs. And if a court ever really looked into that, they'd probably say those NDAs are no longer worth the paper they're written on because in substance, you've just shared it with too many people too widely. So I'm gonna turn back to Virginia at this point to talk about that and summarize in terms of the position that leaves the company with their IP assets. Tom's left me in the unhappy position of uh, showing you a downwards facing curve and nobody wants to see those, right? So this is to try and demonstrate visually what has happened in that case study. So they've got copyright in the software of a product that's no longer unique in the market. They do have expertise in the company, but it's no longer perceived as leading edge. That first mover advantage has gone now over time. There are no trade secrets. Tom has demonstrated the number of ways in which your core confidential information can be nibbled away at over time. They never got a patent, so there's no monopoly rights. So if they are in negotiations, which as you will all know as a startup, at some point in your life, you're going to be in negotiations with big companies that you're partnering with, with potential investors, with your own, with your own board, members of your own board, you are really now in a position where you have much reduced leverage. You had fantastic innovation, fantastic IP, but over time that has simply diminished. So what can be done about that? You could, so you might think, well, what if the startup had applied for patent protection 
before the user interface and the core analytics method entered the public domain. So there you can see a totally different curve of the value of your IP moving up rather than down over time because you've secured your rights in one of those stronger patents that I talked about earlier. You've protected the broad concept and you protected it while it was still new, before it entered the public domain and before competitors caught up with you. So you've significantly leveled the play of playing field now, even with big customer companies. You've also had an opportunity to advertise and defend your innovation along the way. So you've been able to demonstrate by filing a patent application and seeking the grant of a patent that you believe that your technology is innovative and you've been able to brand your technology as being innovative. Also, you've managed to maintain your first mover advantage while doing that because patent applications do stay secret for 18 months after they've been filed. So again, there's a sort of myth that goes around that in order to patent something, you have to give away your technology. You do, but not until 18 months after you filed it, which is ample time generally to, to keep moving and keep developing and keep innovating and keep staying ahead of your competitors. So what next? As Tom said, you, you have an idea when, when you make fantastic new products that you have innovated and you know you need to do something to protect your innovation, but you kind of feel it's inherent because it was so clever and it was all locked down. But now you realize maybe that's not the case and maybe you've got to do something a bit more and you really don't know where to start. So we do. We know how to crystallize your ideas. We know how to turn them into patents and we know how to get those patent applications safely on file for you. So please give us a call and we can give you peace of mind about protecting your innovation. Thank you.